Hi everybody and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for our New Zealand Hops webinar today. We're really excited to be here. I've got a few of my colleagues here. We're excited to have a, a discussion about what is a very new, uh, exciting frontier for us. Uh, in late 2022, Yakima Chief New Zealand Hops Limited entered into a global partnership in order to bring New Zealand hops uh, to brewers all over the world. And we've been extremely excited to, uh, to do that. The two organizations have uh, very similar structures, very similar values, and uh, to be able to bring the two hemispheres together and provide uh, U.S. and New Zealand hops in partnership uh, in the highest quality formats in the world is a very exciting new frontier for us. So today we're here to discuss what that looks like and get a little more familiarity with how hops are grown in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, I'm joined by uh, three of my colleagues. Uh, sitting to my left is Devin Biondi. He's the Director of Sales for New Zealand Hops Limited based here in Spokane, Washington. Uh, <clears throat> Tessa Schlatty is our Sensory and Brewing Research Manager and who works here in Yakima, Washington. And Tiffany Vitra is our sensory, Senior Sensory Manager also based here in Yakima, Washington. My name is Spencer Tilkemeyer. I'm the Director of Sales North America for Yakima Chief Ops and really pleased to be here with you guys today. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and kick, uh, kick off by discussing the NZ growing region. It's quite a bit different than Yakima. We're all very familiar, at least those that have been up to Yakima are familiar with what it looks like to grow hops here in the U.S. Um, things are quite a bit different down there. And uh, Devin, you have a lot of familiarity with that, especially having just arrived back from 2023 yeah, harvest. harvest. And uh, so why don't you walk us through what those growing regions look like and, and how they work. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Spencer. Um, well, before we get started, we're drinking a couple beers here. So um, let's start off with the Single Hill guys who are nice enough to rock out a nice Superdelic uh, IPA with Nectarons. That's Superdelic's our newest uh, release out of our breeding program. Um, so it's a really, really delicious berry, stone fruity IPA. And then uh, Vinny and Natalie were nice enough to send me the Mind of the Younger, which we they included a uh, Nectron in this year, so uh, that we were really excited to see that. I heard it went very fast at the uh, YCH office. Uh, some people <laughs> yeah. didn't go try it, so we're gonna give it a go today after our, uh, our presentation here. But uh, I'm gonna do like a little bit of geography lesson. Um, New Zealand, obviously two islands. Um, all the hops are grown on the South Island, northernmost tip. The whole land mass is probably a similar size to Oregon State, so about four million square miles. Um, so it's, a, it's the, as a whole, it's a pretty small area, um, hard to navigate, so it could take you 20 hours to drive around, but um, a lot of windy roads and everything. But for our purposes today, we're covering about a 40 kilometer circle. Um, we have the Motueka region, Mutri, Greater Tapuera, and then uh, Wakefield, and that's kind of the Waiya Plains. So if we jump into Motueka first, that's where we have about six of our farms uh, currently located. Um, it's about, a mile or two away from the ocean, so you get a little bit different climate than the rest of the, the regions that we have. Um, it's butted, butted up right against a, uh, a mountain range about four or five miles in from the coast, and beyond that is the covering the National Park, so it's a very beautiful area. Um, the soil there is a sandy silt uh, loam, so uh, very free uh, drain. Um, so you got a, a, it's really good for aroma hops uh, that our growers have found. Some of our growers have farms in different regions and they definitely grow variety specific uh, in that area. So the other thing that kind of sense, uh, sets Motueka apart from the other regions is the natural aquifer and it's probably got some of the clearest, cleanest water in New Zealand and by way of what we know about New Zealand and the geography there, it's probably some of the cleanest water in the world. So. Um, the well that they have to get to that area is only about 18 feet, so it's very easy access to water there. Um, whereas it's a little different than the Mutri Valley. So Mutri is the next region down. Um, it's only probably about a 15 minute drive from Motueka, but that's a lot more clay soil, so nutrient rich. Um, it's kind of like a plate. It definitely holds a lot of the nutrients in. So we have some growers that just focus a variety specific and one that they've kind of um, decided is they get better yield from better uh, aroma and hot flavors. Nelson Sauvin grows really well in the Moody Valley. So uh, same well in that region, to give you guys a little perspective, is about 1,200 feet deep, so uh, it gets down there. So um, they also supplement some of their water from a natural catchment in the mountain around it. 
So that's how their irrigation goes. Um, they also have the Motueka River, which outlets near Motueka um, into, the, into the sea. So um, moving along from there, we would have the Tapuera region, which is the most inland portion of uh, the, the growing region for us. This is our most expansive geographically. We have 11 farms in that region. Um, this is, used to be a very dairy, uh, dairy um, a lot of dairy farms, and so it's been converted slowly to hops and other crops. Um, the soil there is like a free draining, it's very alluvial, stony, so the one thing they don't have that the, uh, it gets a little warmer in the, the in summer because they don't have the bruise off the ocean. Um, it heats up a little quicker, which causes a lot of fast uh, growth early. So, I mean, if you were there in December or January, you'd definitely see, uh, if you drove around the whole region, that the tapware would tend to be shooting up a little bit quicker. Um, so uh, then with uh, the rest of the tapware, so there's a, it's a valley, so there's a lot of hills, so it's protected from a lot of the wind that the, the Wakefield area tends to get. So it's kind of enclosed there, but a, a warmer climate. Um, and then with Wakefield, that's called the Waimea Plains. That's probably the windiest area. We have about five farms there. Um, very windy, well not very windy, but windier than the rest of them, I guess you'd say. Um, this, is, uh, this area has, is the closest to like Nelson and Richmond, so a little more of the city center. You probably get there in 15 minutes um, from, from Nelson Airport. So this has less weather events than um, some of the areas that are a little closer to the water. Um, less mite pressure from the mites are a little more in Tepuera than they are in the other regions and that might just because of the like, wind and in being more inland and being warmer which is probably the deduction there um so yeah we uh that the wakefield area grows a lot of grapes you're trying to get like closer to the the wine growing region in um uh marlboro so that's uh, kind of a breakdown of that area they as also well. have a uh, very famous meat pie bakery. So I don't have Wakefield meat Bakery. Pies, Wakefield Bakery is the place to go. Right? It is. <laughs> um, so with that, I would probably jump into a quick uh, harvest update for you guys. So um, timeline: we uh, have got some product on the the water now. And so the good thing about this is we got the it on the last year was a bit of a shipping nightmare to get hops here. So I think we got our first hop late July, maybe early August, which is Pretty late. I mean, overall, there was a big, I uh, feel like, hangover from pandemic of shipping. The costs were higher. It was taking longer to get the, the hops out of our, our port into like a deep water port. Um, this year, it's, it seems to be going a little faster. So, I'm fierce cross, we're getting these hops in June, which would be nice. Um, we have some of the uh, bells on the way for our cryo, which is an exciting thing we'll talk about uh, shortly. But overall, the, the crop year was. Uh, better than last year, 2022 was kind of a, a historically bad um, low sunshine hour, so obviously with low sunshine, the yields are a little lower. Uh, this year was better, but not like great, so um, we did see an increase in a lot of the crops we had. I mean, it's all across the board with varieties, obviously, so one that we didn't have a great year was Ruwaka. It was down a little bit as overall yield. The quality's good, but just like overall yield was kind of a little rough when we like. We'd love to grow more of it. It's just a temperamental hop that's kind of a tricky one. Um, Nectron, Super Delic had a great year with. Um, they're definitely ones that are like on the higher end of our averages um, of overall uh, kgs per hectare, which we can uh, get to a little later too. Um, but we had consistent rain. We actually had record rainfall in July, which is the winter time down there. Um, two feet of rain in July, so that's like, that set a, a all-time record. There's a lot of flooding. Um, but one thing about the regions is being spread out is nice because uh, this is a small country in the South Pacific, so there's still major weather events that happen. Uh, cyclone hit the North Island in in February, and like it was a natural like a national disaster. They've only uh, had three in our history of uh yeah so this is a rough one um but uh with the weather patterns being spread out in a, in a co-op like we are you have a little bit of insurance because if somewhere gets hit with a hailstorm like you did three years ago some areas got kind of decimated others kind of uh, made it through and we were able as a co-op to kind of surpass that so that's a little harvest breakdown for you guys i don't know if any other questions about it but yeah, I appreciate the context, uh, Devin. Not having ever been down myself, I, it's a fascinating thing because um, 
there are a lot of similarities. We, we see, generally speaking, that you know, growing hops in Oregon is pretty significantly different than growing hops in Washington and Idaho, which are much more desert climates. Yep. It seems like you've got some similar phenomena going on down there, inland versus coastal. <clears throat> and I would imagine that our Oregon guys could probably share some more stories with those coastal guys. And uh, <laughs> yeah. the inland guys uh, could relate more to the Washington uh, side of things. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty cool and, and, uh, and interesting here too about the, some of the differences in irrigation and stuff like that. I really like what you said about <clears throat> sort of some of the geographic uh, diversity that you have and what that means from a risk mitigation standpoint. It's one of the things that we uh, really similarly rely upon here. We have farms in, in all three states and we tend to, uh, you know, uh, have a lot of geographic diversity where things are uh, grown. And I think that there's a lot to be said for, for what that means from a crop stability standpoint. You know, things like uh, heat and smoke and everything like that that we've had challenge with in the pit in the past few years have been uh, typically geographically isolated, right? So there is some insurance to be had in, in, that, um, in that way. So, but pretty cool and, and uh, looks beautiful. I can't say that uh, we have quite that, that access to water uh, to, to the ocean here. So that's, that's pretty neat to Three see Three national that. parks within an hour, I think. Yeah. That's incredible. That's yeah, pretty sweet. So. Yeah. Uh, meat pies too. Uh, that's on, I'm, I'm sold there, so. Uh, <laughs> So obviously, um, it's not just because they're from another place that makes these hops special. What's historically made brewers so enamored with them is the varieties involved, and particularly the fact that they produce some really unique uh, aromas and flavors that hops nowhere else in the world do. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's what we're here to discuss, and that's what you guys are constantly pursuing with the breeding program. So um, Tiffany and Tessa, why don't we dig in a, a little bit to, uh, to some of those specific profiles and what they look like for individual varieties. Yeah, so we're super excited because this was the first year that we were actually able to go down and select um, our lots to um, purchase for all of these varieties. And uh, so what we actually have up on the screen is um, our radar diagram for the bales that we received uh, immediately after harvest for Nelson and then the cryo pellets we produced right afterwards. So you can see the comparison there. Um, but Nelson is probably a very familiar variety with a lot of brewers, but tends to can go from a little bit grassy to pretty dank, decently I mean, garlicky. But uh, in the middle there, there's the citrus, tropical, white wine flavor that you can get, kind of that catty Sauvignon Blanc. Um, Sauvignon Blanc is very popular varietal grown in New Zealand so to actually taste those passion fruity catty wines there and then also experience that in the hops was really exciting for me um, but yeah so we tend to see a uh, really high tropical passion fruit notes uh, a little bit of resinous stink um, but I don't know if you have anything you want to add yeah we, we ran some like single hop dry hop trials um, with some New Zealand varieties and one of them was Nelson and um, you know, we always blind code them for our panelists. So they have no idea what they're about to taste, so they can't bring any of these preconceived notions about what they think the, the hop and uh, the beer should taste like. But um, for this beer with a, just a single Nelson dry hop, um, our panel said grapefruit, cedar, mango, and rose, which sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nelson has a very interesting history. So it was released in 2000. Um, that was a, a tough time for New Zealand and probably the whole hop industry. Uh, for that next decade, I think there's like probably 100,000 acres lost. Um, and they were it's kind of a, it was like a commodity hop cycle market. So if you weren't getting a ton of kgs out of your acreage, then you were, it's tough to be viable. It was the time when everyone thought synthesized oils were going to take over the world. And um, a lot of people in New Zealand did, weren't sure if like the, the hop industry was even going to be uh, around in some years. So, it was kind of a fork in the road moment for a lot of the growers because they were releasing a lot of hops. There's no hops grown actually in New Zealand, so they've probably been brought overseas, either the United States, Germany, or uh, England. And um, so when they come up, they had this hop that was so off the wall. And honestly, when it started, people were so like, didn't know what to do with it. The cappy, like, it was just like, <laughs> what are you giving us? This is just like, uh, what are we supposed to do with this? And then um, the reason that it actually became what it was is that Lion, one of our, like a major uh, brewery in New Zealand and worldwide, did some brewing trials with it and then they got those white wine padded fruit notes from it. And that's kind of really what brought Nelson Sava to the world. And then in the United States, I mean, obviously I think it's probably chalked up to the Alpine guys and the Rosa Nelson um, that kind of created that craft, just boom. And like what now it's what it is today, kind of. Mm -hmm. Save the whole industry in New Zealand, so kind of oh, interesting cool. tidbit. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, yeah, so I think we could probably go on to 
Motueka then? Mot, that's what everyone was calling it in New Zealand. Mot, yeah. So I don't know if that's the cool way to say it. I that's guess. cool. <laughs> Abreeves are very good. <laughs> Abreeves. Uh, yeah, so um, we smelled, this is probably the second largest acreage maybe in New Zealand. I, I think Nectaron's it now, okay. but there are no since one Nectaron and Motueka are probably yeah. pretty neck and neck at the moment. Okay, so it seems, you know, a little bit lower overall aroma intensity, but has kind of those citrusy lemon lime aromas. Um, tropical, our panel usually tends to pick up really floral notes out of this, actually out of all of the New Zealand hops. Um, but Mott specifically, we get a lot of floral notes from. Um, I thought this was a really great hop to get more familiar with, and I will just say that going down there for selection for my first time, it was really exciting to me because we've always received kind of smaller volumes of New Zealand hops in the past, and this was our first opportunity to really start to define the specification of each variety, um, the aromas that we're looking for, what's the range across the variety, and to hone in on, on what we want to pick to procure for our brewers. Um, so yeah, as you can see from the citrus, tropical, um, really lost a lot of that woody, um, spicy, and grassy character and making it into the cryo format. So I'm excited to try some beers with this, but oh. I think, did we do a brewing trial? Yeah. I missed it, but. <laughs> um, yeah, no, we did. Uh, the top descriptors were creamy, grapefruit, and peach. Oh, okay, mm. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> creamy is an interesting one. We don't see that one too often, but I see there's a pretty uh, sweet aromatic yes. spike, at least in the cryo. And I think one of our learnings from selection was uh, one day, I think, when we were doing this, was the the second half of it, and we were doing Nelson first. Oh yeah, that's And it was kind of bad, like, you gotta start with Motueka. First, cause like, Nelson's so like, just bang in your mm -hmm. face, that it was kind of like, selecting after that, you're kind of, your nose was just like, blown out. And next time we'll start with the, the Motueka, yeah, and then like... and go from there. Yeah. I think that's, a, that's an interesting feature of it though, and one of the reasons why I'm so intrigued by it, and ha have been, is that we don't have a lot of, uh, sort of, craft space, hops that are low alpha and, and more nuanced intensity anymore. We have a lot of these these hops that are in the 12 to 15 percent alpha range and they all kind of hit at the same intensity mm -hmm. level. I would compare it to something like Crystal, which has always been a favorite of mine, right? It's like in the five five to seven percent alpha range, tends to play well in lagers, tends to play well in some nuance styles, can definitely support an IPA, hold its own in there. There's a lot to be said for a utility hop that fits that that kind of space. And I think Motorik is kind of in that same space for me where it's like, it really could, uh, you know, uh, toe the line between a lot of different styles and things like that. So there's, there's utility in that, especially in cryo format. I don't know what the, uh, what it ended up at, but I would, I would bet the alphas are somewhere in the like low, low teens. And that's, there's a lot of utility in that for like a hazy IPA whirlpool. You're not looking for a huge amount of BUs. You want to really juice up the, the aroma intensity and stuff. And so pretty cool, um, way to be able to utilize the hop. It's, it's our control hop for our breeding oh, yeah. program. Yeah. <laughs> so like yeah. that's like the base. Yeah. And it's a pretty early harvest variety too, so yeah. we're actually able to taste some fresh hop pilsners when mm -hmm. were oh, cool. released when we were down there, so that was really exciting. Oh, uh, but we need to find one more early yeah. release <laughs> window. Uh, they're all coming at the same time. So you're yeah. both <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have the same problem. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we're, well, we're walk is also a pretty early Right, yeah, right. earlier, yeah, but there's just less of it, so it's like, and a yeah. tough one. What do you want? Oh, walk a two. Oh. All right, walk a two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, I don't have very much experience. Okay. Uh, I don't have very much experience. Yeah, walk a two is a, a hop that I believe is going to cryo this year, so we wanted to chat a, bit, a little bit about that one. Um, this was originally NZ or NZ Hollertau Roma, um, so it's a Hollertau and uh, NZ variety. Uh, crossing. Um, this was released in 1988, so it was a little bit, it was one of the early, early ones, so probably Dr. Ron's career, who we'll talk about in a, in a minute, but um, definitely a dual-purpose dual hop. The reason we really wanted to chat about this one is because this was like the number one hop coming out of New Zealand for 20, 20 25 years. Uh, this used to be uh, about 300 tons a year, which, it, like, as the life cycle goes for any hop, you can kind of see it wane, but, um, yeah, this used to be used, I believe, in Coors Light. So Coors would buy about 25 to 30% of the entire New Zealand crop every year, which is pretty crazy. So um, until Nelson Sun came along, and this kind of blew up and we went a different way. So yeah, that's walking to. Yeah, we did do a dry hop um, trial with that one. And I was expecting more of, you know, this like citrus, grassy, woody, uh, more of those noble characteristics, but the panelists said orange, uh, grapefruit, and mango. So that's yeah, some cool. through on that. 
We haven't really received we haven't received that for crab yet, so I yeah. don't know. We'll have we'll we'll sensory we'll there. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's part of what we're needs. what we're here. Like we all yeah. three of us have worked in US ops for years, but like this is this is a brave new world for us, right? Yeah. I don't I've not brewed even when I was a brewer, I've not brewed with a lot of New Zealand hops and so I think that many of the people that are in the audience are in the same boat too, which is like historically because of the, the smaller amounts of acres and things like that, it's not like there's been like abundant access out there and that's part of what makes this so exciting is that we all get to kind of discover these, these tops together, right? Yeah. So there's some there's something to be said for that. So Ruwaka, the enigmatic beauty. Yeah, let's start a count. Yeah, go for it. Alright, so Ruwaka was a uh, desaws and originally, so you can tell we weren't really in the eighties. 90s we weren't super creative and like marketing i don't know if it didn't exist back then or what but we just uh we'd get a hobby like b sauce and we'd have super alpha and then alpha realm so it was like really really intriguing names <laughs> we kind of rebranded in the 2000s um to have these like regionally specific names so Rewaka is actually where our breeding program is it's a it's a little town in uh outside of Matueka. um but this was released in 1994 um, this is just like, I don't know, people love it. It's like the gold dozen beer. It's, uh, we just wish it wasn't so detrimental. It's a really tricky one to kind of, to try and grow. Um, we have fourth, fifth year crop because it doesn't do a great job with the root reserves. Mm -hmm. So after the first year, the second year is usually the hardest. You have the first year and then when you come back, there's like so little root reserves that like it really takes four or five years to, um, to kind of get your basis and you're still not getting a ton of, uh, kgs per hectare it's like 1300 which is the low so it's like what for the math for the people at home 2800 pounds um so yeah it's a really tricky one for the the growers to grow it's it's uh really weather dependent and yeah it's all bored but it's a lovely hop and then if you try some of these great hops with Ruwak in it it's just a beautiful hop i really love it well, you look at the alpha and look at the oil and you're thinking i you know i was looking at the table thinking this is going to be a it is it's under 10 percent alpha but then you rub it and it just punches you in the face with citrus and passion fruit um these really strong aromas i i, I don't know and then tasting it in here it really does really shine um so it's kind of a surprising one to me and i'm really it was one that every single grower that we visited brought up and it was i was so pleased to be talking to a co-op about it because it seemed like they're all exchange ideas on how to get the best yield of this variety that's under such high demand and that they see so many struggles with so exchanging ideas and uh, sharing techniques to make sure that they're going to get the highest yield possible and be able to kiln it perfectly so that it doesn't turn or anything i think is uh, really an advantage that we have to having this great grower base there um so i'm excited to try more of that hop but i felt every single lot that we smelled seemed really consistent and uh, just punchy um i'm gonna say juicy but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, did we end up brewing with this one? I can't remember if we uh, had. No, we did. Okay. No. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, elusive, as you said. It's yes, it is. Crayons. We tend to send it out of market. <laughs> Just let people decide for themselves. Yeah. We didn't want to hog it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth probably mentioning that <clears throat> there are some commercial examples of these beers out, out in the market at this point. Uh, so no root needed from Breakthrough Brewing Company is a is a is a Nelson beer that we uh, that is actually also features Motuek and Waka. Man, that one punched. I don't know if you were yeah. at the, the New Zealand Thursday I, Thursday, but whoo, okay. no root needed indeed. It's no very needed. Alex, pretty. Alex, uh, the founder, and I used to work together. Oh, nice. Oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. nice. So, I think it was like 12 pounds per good barrel. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, was, he, yeah. he loads up. It was an imperial <laughs> IPA in the truest sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Meet the Motuecas, uh, Hop Butcher is one of our, one of our favorite breeds in the Chicago land area and they have the Meet the series and it tends to feature, uh, you know, mainly one hop or single hop basically. Mm -hmm. And so this one, Motuecas is, a, 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 that's a great one to seek out if you're looking to ca you know, gather what the profile of Motueka is. Uh, Death Coast uh, Rift Brewery Company are some of my favorite uh, brewers in Southern California and uh, guys that play disc golf with and generally while we're playing disc we're going to drink something like Death, Death Coast and I can say that that, that beer is awesome. wonderful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a West Coast lager with Ruwaka, Ruwaka, Ruwaka 86, yeah. Yeah. Mosaic, it's, yeah. Dang, it's, what's not to like there? Exactly. It is awesome. So, uh, and then we'll talk about Nectaron in a moment, but obviously we're drinking uh, uh, two beers today that have a, a Nectaron feature to them. And uh, Holy Mountain is uh, produced Nectaron de Monto, which is West Coast IPA brewed with Nectaron. Just tends to 
yeah, we'll, we'll talk about Nectrum actually at this very moment, but it's, it's <laughs> such an exciting hop for so many reasons. And I think analytically, when we get to survival's, survival's portion of this discussion, we can kind of start to gather why it's such an impactful hop. It really has a lot of the things that make good hops go. And so, yeah. um, Tiffany, what, what was your impression of this one, Harvest? Yeah, well, I actually thought that Nectaron had um, the most consistent quality. Uh, it seemed really dialed in and tight, and I think that's because it's a later release top uh, that's really well managed um, by the group. So I felt that every single lot that we smelled was super punchy with citrus and peachy nectarine stone fruit um, and then juicy pineapple as well um, and every time we rubbed it i just feel like my hands were completely like weird, sticky and just covered um, it was kind of a mess but really exciting to actually the best mess. yeah the best kind of mess of course um and you know we kept hearing over and over from growers when we would stop by that this was like their favorite hop to grow right now it's just they were getting exceptional yield out of it uh, the plants looked beautiful the cones are giant and if you take any off it's maybe three would fit in my hand but and they're just huge and dense and um so and have a lot of good stuff um, which we could do on our hands so i thought this was really exciting to smell and then we are starting to see it like pop up in so many beers so yeah. it's nice to actually taste in a beer what you smell on the table too that doesn't always happen and i would say that nectaron is one of those hops that does that um so i find that really encouraging and exciting <laughs> this was uh released in 2020 partially so it's still like i feel like it's still on its like half the mm -hmm. popularity the people that are using it are definitely the early adopters are trying to put, find more spaces for it in in the birdhouse and in some other production beers but I'd be remiss if we don't talk about the name because Nectaron, named after Dr. Ron Beeson, who's been the lead breeder for our, uh, the plant food research hop breeding program for 40 years. Uh, so all the hops that we've talked about today, he's got a hand in breeding and crossing. Uh, so it kind of came from Nectar of the Gods and, and Ron. So it's like his mic drop, 17 years in the <laughs> making. Like, he's now retired from hop breeding, but he's actually working with us as a brand ambassador, which is awesome. We're, we're super excited and lucky to have him. He'll be at CBC too, so keep that in mind. He is a celebrity. Yes, he is. I met him in 2015 and had always wanted to go plant and food research. So to actually be there this year, yeah. it was like a dream come true for me. <laughs> There's something to be said for a hop that has, it sounds like a pretty forgiving pick windows too, just mm -hmm. consistency yeah. and stuff. like we, we see that on the U.S. side a lot. It's just, some varieties <clears throat> are hellaciously unforgiving. You know, the difference between a day or two and a pick window can be the difference between what brewers want and what they don't. Right. Then we have some hops like Simcoe that is just like, they just tend to hang and they tend to be quality and they come in and they, they deliver, right? And uh, it's it's nice to hear that, that Nectaron is exhibiting some of those same, at least in the early going, some of those same characteristics because that's that's good for growers, it's good for brewers. There's, like, there's a lot to be said for that. Because well, so. Nelson Dotman falls into that yeah. first category. Yeah. It, it, when it's time to go, it needs to go. Yeah. Um, so this is nice because they're in similar pick windows and these, these they could hang on to these. And then some mm -hmm. of the growers were just getting like exceptional yields this year. Like they were filling, two rows were filling their kilns and they were just yeah. like, I don't know what to do with this. Like shutting on my machine, my mm -hmm. picking machine. So it was, it was, yeah, good, good crop year. And we're excited to see how the, uh, the cryo uh, comes out. It'll be exciting. Yeah. Last but not least, Superdelic. Superdelic. Yeah. Well, I don't really know how much is planted right now or how much was harvested this year. We were shooting for about 17 tons. So I think we came in probably like six around there, maybe a little more. Uh, this is the most recent release from our plant breeding program, it was NZH 102, so uh, yeah, we're super excited about this one. It's a kind of a off the wall. The growers are super pumped about it because it's like something so different than uh, previous like New Zealand hop releases. So it has like a super high oil content for New Zealand hops. It gets up the 2.2 range in troll oils, which uh, traditionally is like 1.7 is kind of the upper ceiling there with uh, Necron and Nelson Savin. So this is like, kind of has this really deep oil content and then like a higher berry flavor, which is something that you haven't seen a lot of in the uh, New Zealand uh, hop aroma kind of profile usually. Like the, the berry, the uh, the candy. So it's got this sweet aromatic and rubbing it fresh with like really- Lolly. Lolly, it's really lolly. awesome. Yeah, the <laughs> lolly airplanes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know um, Cloudburst did a um, superdelic beer called Your Own Research, which I think is hilarious, but um, our pan got peach, pineapple, banana, and then kind of a woody resinous fish. So. How often does banana pop up? 
Not super often. No. <laughs> Barry doesn't. I can say we've we've uh, racked our brains and put our hair out over Barry for years. It's one of the hardest profiles to nail. One of the hardest flavors to understand when and where it's coming from. Yeah. We get a lot of requests for Barry, and it's it's just very difficult to say that a lot is going to. I think of it like blueberry. We all know what blueberry tastes like, but it's maybe like one out of ten blueberries in the garden actually tastes like that. And the rest <laughs> just sort of tastes like generic fruit. Yeah. That's how I feel about Barry. But so far, the beer that I've had with Superdelic have all delivered upon that red red berry character, some strawberries, some currant, that kind of thing. <clears throat> have that in your back pocket, it's pretty handy for a brewer. So yeah. I would say early returns on this have been really, really good and I've been excited about it. The branding's beautiful too, my compliments to you guys. I think it's, yeah. it's got some cool That's artwork funny. associated with it. It's very psychedelic looking, I, mm -hmm. I really love it. Yeah. It accentuates their hops really well too, so it plays well in the, the sandbox, I should say. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, it kind of like lifts up everything that, that it um, plays with, but like, Tech, it could be over hop, so it's like use efficiently in the mm -hmm. brew house. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Excellent. So the we often say that there's two sides to a coin when it comes to hops. It's qualitative and quantitative, and a lot of what Tessa and Tiffany spend their time on is the qualitative side of describing what we're smelling, running sensory panels, and things like that. That's what the human nose picks up. There's a quantitative side that we can also enumerate, and that comes from lab analysis. And um, we <clears throat> have uh, sort of distilled that into a framework that we call survivals. And what that is, is essentially a, a look at a hops uh, analytical chemistry through the lens of what we believe to be the most important, most durable, and most beer soluble compound that are present in hops. If anybody would like a deep dive primer on that, we have uh, those available on our webinar page at hopandbrewschool.com. Uh, we can get very, very deep in the weeds on that. But for now, suffice it to say, I, I'm going to assume that most people are relatively familiar with this, with these compounds. And um, it's very exciting today to, to be able to discuss what uh, these NZ hops are looking like from a profile perspective analytically, because that's one of the first questions that we got when we released this chart was, when are you going to have this on there? When are you going to, you know, when are you going to be able to show me what some of these other hops look like? So uh, with that in mind, Tessa, you were really deeply involved in this research originally. Why don't you discuss kind of what we're seeing from an analytical side? Yeah, so um, we were yeah, finally able to kind of get enough um, lots of these New Zealand varieties to run the analysis required to um, plug them in onto the, to the survival chart and see how they kind of stack up against uh, some of these other Pacific Northwest uh, varieties and uh, they're kind of spread out um, and just to kind of reiterate you know the point of this part isn't um, like uh, it's not a scale of good to bad um, you know things that are lower in survivables tend to just be more useful um, when you add them a little bit later in the brewing process um, because those survivable compounds are lower in the varieties they're less likely to make it through to final beer whereas um, varieties that are you know, really high in these survivable compounds, um, you can get away with adding them a little bit earlier in the brewing process because um, they're so chock full of these compounds that survive that there's going to be plenty there to, to make it into um, beef flavor act in the final beer. Um, so just looking at um, how the, these uh, four or five New Zealand varieties kind of stacked up on the chart, um, I'm going to actually go right to the left. Unusual, I know. <laughs> um, but so Nelson, you know, is relatively high in alpha acids, but um, a little bit lower in survivables here. So um, my recommendations based on this would be to um, focus on using that variety a little bit later in the brewing process, which I think is um, probably fairly Pretty typical. Standard. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, Obviously, it would be fine earlier on, but you'd extract a lot more of that bitterness, which may or may not be what the brewer is looking for. Um, Motueka, or Mott, and uh, Rewaka are right next to each other. No, and yeah, yeah Motueka and Rewaka right are right next to each other. Um, but you can actually see that they have pretty different um, kind of compositions of the, of the different survivable compounds. I noticed um, that Rewaka is a little bit more kind of like evenly distributed with um, the different compounds. It's a little bit more um, balanced, I would say. And to me, just like looking at this chart, as someone who hasn't had a lot of opportunity to brew with that variety, but I see this um, kind of even spread of compounds, that to me says like a variety that would play really well in a blend and kind of like elevate everything else. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of how I would interpret interpret the, this data based on um, what I know about survivables. Um, as we move up to Superdelic, um, starting to get into what I would consider high survivables territory uh, with that variety. Um, 
And we did see this in our brewing trials uh, where we, you know, dry hopped the super delic and then measured the survivables in the final beer. Um, so th this chart represents survivables in the hop, um, but we also like to, you know, track them in beers that um, we've brewed using these hops. And uh, yeah, super delic was, was really high of, of the um, varieties that we looked at. And then nectaron's just kind of like a monster. Um, especially with the draniol and linalool, um, huge draniol, maybe the biggest draniol on the chart. With second, second only to Talus, which is the current reigning queen. So, and that's yeah. that's big. It's very very close. Even, right. So, we're talking large draniol content. Yeah, totally. And I think that that kind of goes that speaks to some of those like floral characteristics. Draniol obviously is um, pretty. I mean, I think it smells like rose, but it was obviously named for geranium. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, that's gonna deliver a pretty big punch of these survivable compounds into the final beer um, when used early or late. You know, it, it looks pretty versatile to me based on this. Yeah, I think there's a lot to, to take away here. It's it's a fascinating thing, and just to kind of remind folks to uh, sort of or emphasize what Tess said, we're not talking about here. We're talking about quantity of total compounds. We're typically not talking about quality of total compounds here. That's where sensory analysis would come into play. So we can tell you how much is in something. We can't necessarily tell you exactly what it's going to smell like, right? But uh, we can. This this graph does help us for, offer an interpretive key into where these hops are going to make their highest impact. And we know hops like Super Duck and Nectron have historically we we don't have a ton of them, right? So you ought to use them where they're going to be most effective. To make sure what supply is is increasing as acreage increases and stuff like that, but use them where they're going to make their best impact, right? You're you know you've got this precious cargo here, and you might as well use it where you can to to make the beer the best that it can be. As I look at this, um, what what strikes me one thing is that Motueka, interestingly enough, and this tracks with what you guys said from a sensory perspective, is uh, lower overall than than Centennial, but uh, proportionally speaking is very Centennial-like. It looks very similar to Centennial. And actually, if you look at them from an alpha perspective, Motueka is almost like half the alpha and oil of what of what Centennial is. It obviously smells different in t some cases than Centennial, but you did mention floral, which is a hallmark characteristic of Centennial. Some citrus, the citrus in Motueka tends to be more lemon-lime than orangey and stuff like that. But interesting to think of them in that similar space of things that could make a high impact in that sort of floral boosting category. Um, as I look at Superdelic, I see that it's really high 2-MIB, 2-methylbutyl isobutyrate, which is an ester that tends to be very apricotty and berry-like, which yeah. very much tracks with our experience of Superdelic here, which is, I think, stone fruit has been the number one yeah. thing that people have said, and berry has been number two. So seeing that, 586 has a relatively similar profile. So for those of you that have used 586, there could be some, I would say, falling to the same aroma family. There could be some, uh, some characteristics there. And then... Nectaron, like we said, draniol is one of the most, uh, I, the things that I hone, on, hone in on most quickly when I'm looking at these figures is uh, just particularly because of what an impact they can have on a hot side addition. Uh, linalool and draniol are the two that we're going to look for. When I, whenever I'm trying to recommend something that's going to in hot side, I'm going to look for something that's high in one or both of those just because it's so translatable. It tends to be so durable and so soluble. Um, and seeing be up there with talus, with the talus is a heavy hit on draniol. That's really exciting because it means that what you smell on the table is likely going to translate very, very readily to beer. And so far, that is bearing out in, in what we see in, in the nectar on beer. So um, I'm stoked to have this stuff available on the chart and everything like that because it's it's something we've never had before. So another note about draniol is that it it um, has been shown in like academic literature to um, biotransform into beta citronellol which is not present in hops uh, in a measurable amount so um, if you can kind of pack that wort stream with draniol um, and give that to the yeast then it'll take care of it and turn it into some really lovely complex citrus character that um, is difficult to get otherwise so yeah late late whirlpool nectar on at fermentation dry hop nectar on that should produce a pretty pretty powerhouse beer for yeah. sure so very exciting to see that so we did mention also that we are, uh, for the first time ever, uh, producing New Zealand hops as a part of this partnership into the cryo hops format. Cryo hops being a patented uh, pellet technology that we employ here at uh, Yakima Chief. Um, <clears throat> so it's a pretty natural fusion of, of the, the, what we intend to do with any hop that we procure and that we are responsible for is to provide it in different formats, but particularly ones that are value added for brewers worldwide. Uh, the benefits are obvious, uh, obviously increased yield because cryo is a concentrated pellet format. Uh, you're just putting less hot matter into the fermenter, right, or in the whirlpool. 
Uh, so, but that also has downstream effects, less effluent, right? So a lot of city, you know, city sort of municipalities are getting more and more scrutinizing of what people are putting down the drain. Putting less into the fermenter means less down the drain. But yeah, it's also stuff for sustain those that are pursuing sustainability goals. It's, it's less carbon footprint to ship it, to store it. Um, and ultimately, we believe in a lot of cases it provides a better aroma experience for brewers because a lot of uh, leaf, uh, leaf and less overactive material is being removed and what you end up with is a lupulin enriched pellet. That is, in our opinion, the highest quality pellet in the industry. Um, <clears throat> we produce it with vast amounts of liquid nitrogen to ensure that the integrity of the pelleting and the lupulin gland, the lupulin glands are almost like sand as they're being sifted through cryo process and they're so cold that you can actually separate them almost like a, a sand like material. And they're just so intact by the time that they get pelleted that it produces this incredibly, uh, it's been babied all the way through the process, right? So it's a it's a lowest HSI pellet that we produce. It's the lowest temperature pellet that we do. Um, so our first run, we did we air freighted over some bales of a few of these varieties to have some beers ready for CBC. So for those of you that will attend CBC, you get to try some. That was on April 12th. Uh, we're in the midst of getting our our larger bale shipment over and beginning full full processing of of NZ Cryo. Um, Devin's actually going to be doing a, a kind of a cryo tour with Dr. Ron Beethan right after CBC and making a bunch of beers in the United States with, with NZ Cryo, which is super exciting. Um, so uh, the varieties, uh, as of right now, for right off the bat at least, are uh, Nelson, Ruwaka, Motueka, and Ron, and we'll continue to expand that as, as time goes along. Um, but yeah, super excited to just see uh, products from other hemispheres, other growing regions make it into the cryo format because we have so much global success with, with cryo and seeing all the benefits that it provides to brewers. Um, it's a natural kind of folding in of our own mission too. So, very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to do some, some brewing at the New Yeah, area. we're doing New York, Chicago, Bay Area, LA. Tour. Dr. Ron's going on a world of other national tour. National tour. Yeah. Yeah. Tour. yeah. So yeah. you yeah, I haven't I haven't even seen any of the pelts myself yet. So you'll be one of the first users that's, that's really excited. Yeah. Excited. yeah, if you are at CBC, um, we have a beer produced by Monday Night Brewing Company that involves Cryo Motueka that is going to be very, very good. So I'm looking forward to having one of them down there. So will that be with the Bract program or is it um, separate uh, from that? Separate from that. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you touch upon that now, uh, yeah, since we, yeah, segue. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so our BRAC program is a, uh, our, our breeding, the hot breeding program in New Zealand. So and one of the first things to touch on makes New Zealand hops so much different than any hops anywhere else in the world is a, a triploid variety instead of a diploid. So we have three chromosomes. So our, uh, hop plants are, uh, seedless. Uh, so in order to Get to that third chromosome, you have to cross a diploid with a uh, tetraploid, which is four chromosomes, and then you can't uh, divide by three. So we're, we're set there. So that's one of the, uh, the one of the big. Uh, that's like the major difference of ours. We also don't have a lot of disease pressure in New Zealand, so uh, most of our hops or most of the hops don't have to be disease resistant. So that kind of leads our hop breeding much more open time-wise to work on agronomics and hop aroma and flavor. Um, because that's definitely something that you guys have to take into account, like very <laughs> track, like a big time suck, I'm sure. So um, with that being said, we the, the Plant Food Research Institute is a government run organization that we partner with uh, in New Zealand. Uh, they do all kinds of plant breeding. So like kiwis, obviously, kiwi apple, that's like the major export from New Zealand. So that's the most of it. So we're like a little sliver of it, but like a very important sliver, I think. So. Um, that was Dr. Ron, who I was talking about earlier. He had been there for 40 years. Um, his uh, replacement, Kerry Templeton, has been doing an awesome job. He's been there for about five years where we work together in tandem. Uh, he also brings a bit of a home brewing background. So we have a one barrel SS brew tech system in there, and he's brewing anywhere. He also has a brewer on site as well. So they're brewing between 12 and 15 different single varieties every week. So we're looking at over like 700 a year. So we are running through this. It's kind of like a, like a March Madness tournament where it's really quick. Like, is this one winning or bad? It's out of here. So uh, they run through those. And like we said earlier, Motueka is the, uh, the, the control beer. So it'll just be like a normal pale ale to control. Um, but yeah, going through that many hops, uh, we start with the, the, the cream of the crop. And then we go down to the, the in-house brew trials. And from there, it'll look, we'll look at propagating them and then bring them out to we probably have three or four growers to start with our trial, uh, trial hop uh, propagation. And then see how that agronomically uh, works in the field. And then uh, from there, we will 
moved that to the advanced uh, uh, trial stage, and that's when we started doing brain trials uh, throughout the world, US, Europe, New Zealand, obviously, and Australia. So we have a couple of trusted breweries that we uh, work with to uh, give those a shot and then give us feedback. And yeah, it's a, it's a really exciting program. It's something that we're super proud of, and it's created a lot of awesome hops, a lot of the hops that everyone uses come out of that program. So yeah, some pretty exciting stuff out of that. It's cool to walk in there and have just 10 beers waiting for us. <laughs> so we did all tour of the facility and they talked about, I think it's also awesome that the you know, Karen gets to actually sit on panels for kiwi fruit to berries mm -hmm. and new apple varietals. Um, and then the other breeders will come in and actually taste some of the beers that they brewed as well. So everyone kind of gets to sit on the same, on different sensory panels, I guess, to get different experiences. and. Um, there was one hop in there that I you haven't done it. like this and like gone like number. this to a beer. And <laughs> it was incredible. Actually, yeah. it was just so strong and uh, very, I thought, passion fruity. And also, it was just really complex. Actually, almost mm -hmm. hard to describe. But I really hope that one advances. So I tried to. Uh, as long as it's agronomically sound, yeah, yeah. it's, it's coming. <laughs> That's it's definitely important. coming. That's when the, uh, the growers and then. The, the breeders are the most excited about, so we'll see. You know the one specifically she's talking about? Yeah, I just yeah. can't talk about, like, say the name of it, or not the number. <laughs> it's not uh, at that stage yet, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it was pretty ridiculous. Um, it's Mother's Rewaka, so it's kind of an interesting, yeah. uh, hopefully it agronomically produces more than that, and we, we're all set with a very beautiful hop. Mm -hmm. it, is, it really shows out in the beer. Hopefully she it's gets exactly. all the best qualities from her mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that good pedigree. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, and for those that, you know, are familiar with uh, the way that we produce hops over in the United States it, uh, with uh, Yakima Chief Ranches, generally things make it to what we call it like an elite trial or elite, you know, uh, stage of their, of their development. You guys are very similar over there. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's like HPC 586, 630, 638, 1019 and stuff like that. And for you guys uh, this year, you know, we'll have some names of NZH 101, NZH 105, 105. Uh, 102 was recently named Super Delic, right? right? So that was in the elite program just uh, up to like two months ago. So um, I would say for those out there that are interested in, in being a part of that and, and you know utilizing some hops that are in the pipeline, mm -hmm. uh, that's absolutely something that we can accommodate. Something that we'll continue to to do as uh, as new hops come come through the uh, the breeding program. Yeah, constant change. Yeah. It's nice. I'm all, what I always like about it that, that Jace talks about is I love the fail fast part of it, right? It's like don't don't fall in love with something unless it unless it is going to be the next Nelson or is going to be the next you know Necron something like that. And there's a there's an aspect of that that's that's ruthless, but it is uh, it's efficient. And it's ultimately it's what brewers need and demand, right? It's like it, don't don't waste my time unless it's going to be something that's that good, you know. So I I feel um, like we have very similar. Uh, mindsets when it comes to that, and I, that's why it's so nice to, to have these in our pipeline at this point. So, very exciting. And then uh, we touched briefly upon the concept of CBC and, and what that's all going to look like. We had a lot planned uh, for CBC this year, and I would say uh, a hefty amount of that you know revolves around our relationship with Z Hops Limited and, and what that looks like. We'll have Dr. Ron and some growers there, we'll have um, a whole host of things going on, but one of the most exciting things that we're doing. If we're actually going to be hosting selection for New Zealand hop varieties at CC this year, which is, to my knowledge, something that no one's ever done. I don't know that anyone's ever hosted an off-site selection that's not even in the same country as <laughs> where, the, where the plants were grown, but within a month of things being harvested, right? So for those that are interested, here's what the cores will look like. It's a co-branded core with an NC, NZ Hops and, and Yakima Chief. Um, in the CBC uh, uh, trade show, or sorry, not in the trade show hall, in the trade show building, uh, that's actually Lounge 1B located on level one, so it's actually gonna be out in the foyer. Um, we're going to be hosting a full throttle selection program, so for any of you that have ever selected before, um, the Yakima Chief has, in my opinion, the most sophisticated selection program in the world, and uh, it'll be run just like that, except it's going to be with NZ volumes. Um, What's kind of exciting about it, in my opinion, is that the minimums are quite low. It's only 440 pounds per variety, so it's not like it requires a vast commitment to be able to do this. Um, so we're uh, this year going to be doing Nelson, Motueka, Nectaron, and Ruwaka. So some, so just the hits, sort of, so to, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, and for uh, yeah, for anybody that's interested, we do still have a few slots left. Uh, they they're filling up pretty quickly though, and that'll be on uh, Monday, Tuesday, and a little bit of Wednesday uh, during CBC this year. So. Uh, I'm super excited to do that. I have not been down to New Zealand. I've never actually rubbed a core myself. I will probably do that one once this is over. And uh, so to get to experience, I think all of you know that 
it's a very unique thing to be able to dig into fresh hops in a core format right after harvest. There's nothing quite like it, and it's uh, it does give you such a, a critical impression of what um, what you like and don't like and all these other things in a variety. And we aim to be able to provide that experience at CBC this year, and, and to that end, I think um, it, it represents a, a giant leap forward, I think, yeah. in, in terms of what global hop procurement looks like for brewers. So. And all of the growers in New Zealand are really hungry for brewer feedback as well. So one of the great things, is we focus so much on that, obviously, trying to connect brewers and growers, but we'll be taking all of that data that we collect during CC and being able to package that up and give that feedback to all the growers that we procure from this year. And they are stoked, like so excited. Every every one of them, well, this is when I harvested Nelson. Is it what you like? And they really are, what are, what are your brewers wanting? So I'm just, I hope that everyone's really open and honest with their feedback and uh, I'm just really excited to see how we can provide value also to the growers back in New Zealand. So yeah, it's a natural kind of connecting of the yes. circle because uh, it's it's what we do here, and just applying that same template of, to what you guys do is is gonna be awesome. So I'm super excited. I'll probably spend a lot of my time down there during selection just because I want to see brewers' faces when they <laughs> when they get to do it. So um, so yeah, with that, I think we we have some time to open it up to Q and A here. Uh, for those that are on the webinar right now, there's a chat function where you can uh, insert questions. Uh, please do so. We, we have some expertise in the room here that, that would be really glad to answer your questions. Um, so I'll kick it off with a question, though, about the two regions. So we've discussed today geographically the ways that they're similar and different, the ways that the brewing breeding programs work. There's a lot of similarities. Um, I think if you've never been to either of them, though, the scale is pretty, pretty dang different. Mm -hmm. So maybe can you guys touch upon what like the scale size we're talking about of like U.S. major hop growing versus New Zealand, New Zealand hop growing? Sure. sure. Okay, we'll start <laughs> with New Zealand. Uh, so like I said at the start, uh, the total square footage is just like or footage uh, <laughs> mileage is the same as Oregon State. So like we're talking one of the states that uh, is growing hops in in the Pacific Northwest. So. Um, and our, all our farming in a very distinct region. Um, we're on about 800 hectares, so we're 2,000 acres. The whole re the the whole industry down there is probably about 3,500 acres. So we're growing about 4.4 million pounds, maybe four and a half million pounds a year. Just gone out. So very small, very niche. Like we don't have a lot of area to expand. There's like other farming and kiwis and apples and dairy and everything else, limes, everything you can imagine down there. So. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's a very crafted, like you come to some of these farms, like you saw, They're some so of them are very small <laughs> comparatively. They're so cute. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, and then you compare that to the Pacific Northwest, so just the tri-state area, uh, we're 60,000 acres, yeah. so quite a bit bigger. And I believe Washington in itself uh, produced 48,000 last year with those acres. So, um, yeah, that's just... In comparison, I don't really know our pounds. That's not my. It's about 100 million pounds, okay. probably yeah. the U.S. industry, maybe a little more than that. Uh, it's just rough numbers, but I think it's 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 really useful context because I think historically, for brewers, I, I can see when I was a brewer, it was like, yeah, and that sounds cool if I can never get it, right? Mm -hmm. Like you know, like who knows if I ever could or who came from whatever, you know. And I think so. It's useful for brewers who, like in the past, have not been able to get a hold of it to understand that it partially. That's not that people were hiding from me. It's just very very small acres, yeah. right? <laughs> But it's one of the beauties of this partnership that we have now is because of the way that you guys are uh, expanding acres down there, but also because of the global footprint that ICH has, we really can give brewers ready access yeah. uh, to tops throughout the world and you don't have to go through some crazy like third party back channel to get them. You can get them on the same palette as Citra and Simcoe and Mosaic, right? It's, mm -hmm. And that's a that's a really beautiful thing from a from a utility perspective for brewers and I think uh, it's what's going to allow them to become more mainstays rather than just like, well, I just put in a one-off when I can sometimes get it, but I really most of the time can't, you know? <laughs> exactly. And so that's, um, as, a, as a brewer and somebody who's still is a brewer at heart, I, I feel excited about that, so. Um, so we've mentioned uh, before that the, the two companies are, have really similar values. We've been friends for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. We just have never like, you know, gone into this kind of uh, arrangement. Official. Yeah, exactly. Recorded, exactly. Recorded each other. Facebook official, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, yeah. So uh, maybe I can describe a little bit of how the, the YCH company structure works. Maybe you can describe this, the same thing. But we are a grower-owned co-op, uh, very similarly. We have 14 owners. They're all based here in the Pacific Northwest. So I like to say that like we don't own acres. The acres own us, right? And so we're responsible for making sure that we are uh, producing 
and storing and then eventually servicing and selling the, the best uh, US hop products in the world. And uh, what makes that unique, all the things that, that, that Tiffany just said, we have a direct pipeline back to growers and so things like selection feedback go immediately back to growers and they know, know in real time, they even get push notifications of when, when brewers have uh, selected their hops or left notes on their hops and things like that. And it makes, uh, it makes for a much more two-way uh, flow of information which I feel like ultimately bears out heavily in uh, what the quality that brewers receive is. Growers, as you said before, ultimately they aim to please. It's in their interest to please, right? They're not interested in, in growing a bunch of hops nobody wants. So we, uh, we really find a lot of value being able to pass that information back to, to growers. And I, I believe it's a very similar structure down there. So Yeah, I mean, you covered most of that, but uh, it's just different number, I guess. So we have 27 farms, but that's probably 20, 22 growers. So mm -hmm. some growers on a couple farms. Um, each one, every grower is a grower owner. Um, like I'll be, there's not been a lot of contracts. I think you got some contracts that contracted growers in the outer range. Mm -hmm. All of our growers are grower owners. So um, the grower can meet meetings. There's a lot of opinions and, and things <laughs> like that for sure. But uh, yeah, yeah, right. Democracy um, has yeah. some complicated parts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's very similar. Um, and then my, our job as NZ Hops is to, get uh to tell the story of the growers and, and get their their hops out into the world and into, into beers and then kind of get their one of the partnerships with you guys that you guys have done a super good job of is uh the visibility onto growers and that's something that we kind of strive to do is to get more visibility on our growers because like it's such far up away place that not a lot of people come to yeah and they come to new zealand like they come to yakima every year and they can get drive out to uh wherever they're going, meet the, the, the farmer. But like, now it's like trying to get more visibility onto those guys so you can kind of build that uh, relationship and, 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 and go from there and know where you're uh, sourcing your house from, so. Yeah, I mean, one of the coolest things to me about this industry and ultimately why I've been so romantically involved in it for so long is that uh, there's, I can't think of really any ag crops in the world where other than maybe coffee or something like <laughs> yeah. that, where the person that grew it can share the product and enjoy it together with the person that's using it or making something with it, right? It's like, we can tell you down to the letter, what field, what day it was picked, where, you know, like where, what soil type it was in and, you know, corn and soybeans and all these things, they just go into a giant pile and they get sold and that's fine, right? But, uh, there's a significant amount of sort of uniqueness and specialness to what it means to brew a beer with the hops, you know, and we see that all the time that uh, we've got people that are their Black Star Ranchers through and through, their Double R through and yeah. through, right? And that's because they know the grower and they love them and they love what they do. And that's beautiful to me. That's not, that's a, that, that's really the, the kind of highest expression of the mission. So, um, so yeah, that's uh it's really exciting to work with a very similar structure. Right. It means that we don't have to do any mental lease when we're talking about how this should all work, right? <laughs> yeah, right. So we're like kind of parallel mm -hmm. tracks. This kind yeah. <laughs> Looks like we got a uh, question in the chat. With the lower volumes of NZ hops being grown, are the minimums for selection less? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, so the minimums for uh, selection for NZ volumes are 440 pounds, which is 10 cartons. So uh, quite a bit lower than we do for US varieties. Um, that some of that has to do with the pelleting capacity of the folks at New Zealand hops and the way that they're able to run their pellet lines. Ours are much bigger. We have to have larger lot minimums to be able to run selected lots. Yeah, we have uh, pretty gargantuan pelt lines. And so <clears throat> um, the scale is different and we're able to actually kind of leverage that to the brewer's advantage and allow for uh, smaller selection minimums um, here in the, or in, for, yeah. for New Zealand grown. So. Lots of 5,500 pounds for us. <laughs> yeah, roughly 40,000 pounds. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Not a competition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess Devin, I mean, I, I'm always interested in seeing like, you know, hearing like the breadth and depth of everything of, of what's going on, but ultimately I'm in sales and I'm a brewer and I want to hear what people's opinion on it are. So what's your favorite New Zealand hop and what's your favorite experimental in the pipeline and why? Sure. Um, well, yeah, it's kind of like picking children, I guess. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I'm asking um, you to do so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to. Um, gosh, I really like... It's probably it's like neck and neck between Verwaka and Nectaron. I'm excited for like the future of Nectaron a little bit. Like Verwaka is like kind of a known quantity and it is mm -hmm. what it is, but it's like just such a beautiful hop and used correctly. Um, Nectaron one that's just like, I feel still such in its infancy and growth and like people using it that we're going to see just kind of a bunch of it uh, out there this year and people are already kind of putting it into, into hops. And I just love that pineapple. I think uh, some of the, the, the reason why I like that one so much is the branding that we developed it. Like the marketing of it is, was exceptional. And uh, yeah, it just, 
the brand looks great and that's kind of what you got to do to get stuff out there into the world. No more super aromas or super alphas. And <laughs> it's all going to be fun names going forward, but yeah, the, the best I've had with Nectaron and then especially this one from the Single Hill guys has been just awesome. So. I like those two. And then we were kind of chatting about the experimental one. That one's a, a couple years away. I think there's a total of like probably 88 pounds total this year. So maybe 44 <laughs> coming to the United States. Not a lot. So it's a very small amount, but it's a very exciting. The excitement between the growers and the breeders about that one is just is something else. And if we can somehow, I'll be the most excited if we can somehow find an early window yeah. pick. Yeah. Hop. That would be wonderful for the growers and everyone else in the industry down there. <laughs> Four different people pulled me aside. Have you smelled this one? Yeah. And they kept throwing bags in my face to smell. Yeah. I was like, I have, but they still well, smell good. Yeah. Well, we had a brewer down there, and then uh, even Bridget uh, had the smell in there. Like, hmm, yeah, yeah, we'll see. Be polarizing. And then once uh, they tried it in the beer, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll try all that. I'll taste good. everything you got. We drink a lot of beer, so to have one. Though, you know, yeah, exactly. There's a lot of them sitting there, so for one to stand out the way it did, yeah, it's exciting. I think about that from a brewer's perspective all the time, and I try to use that as my measuring stick of any product or anything that we're going to produce is like, brewers have a lot of good options out there, right? There's a lot of good hops in the world, a lot of good hop products in the world. So if we're going to release something, it better, it yeah. better deliver, right? And that's, so to me, I think, you, you know, maintain that, uh, that perspective <laughs> of the Jade Brewer, which is just like, why should I care, right? And if it pops out a glass like that, that is a good sign that you're on something. So, yep, absolutely. Um, so, well, that brings us to right at an hour, which is probably a good time to go ahead and close. So, thank you everybody who joined us today. Really appreciate it. This will be archived on our on our uh, webinars page on our website and available at hopandbrewschool.com. Um, for those that can uh, that see the screen here, we do have a brewing help desk, uh, brewing help at yakimachief.com. That's uh, a help desk that's staffed by myself and Tessa and Tiffany and a, and a number of other former brewers and lab staff. So a very capable group. If you ever have any troubleshooting questions or dealing with an issue or you just have a curiosity about the hop industry, that's the group to contact and we, we aim to get you a, a relatively quick and informed answer there. Um, and uh, very, very excited to see a lot of you at CBC and hope that you'll come up and introduce yourself if, we, if you're not somebody that we already know. Um, and uh, wishing you guys a, a great summer season and, and looking forward to getting some crop year 2023 volumes out there in the market and, and seeing what these uh, hops in, in beer in the U.S. or so and, and elsewhere. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Cheers.